Um, again, I just want to start by saying I miss you all. Speaking to an empty room here is so odd, but um, it'll be made up for by talking about something that I uh, care about very much. So the title of the, uh, today's talk is uh, Treatment of Facial Paralysis and Synkinesis. And uh, actually, I'm going to reverse these uh, topics on you a little bit. My usual routine is to talk about synkinesis first, uh, or excuse me, is to talk about facial paralysis first. Um, but instead, I'm going to talk about synkinesis. And uh, I have my, my reasons for doing that. I have, uh, let me see here, no disclosures to make. Just make sure here. Great. So w why begin with synkinesis? I think that uh, for me, the issue is, is that synkinesis is the higher prevalence disease. Uh, patients who present with facial paralysis, all comers. The most common cause by far, as we all know, is Bell's palsy. So of the 100 to 140,000 patients a year who have facial paralysis, we've got 50 to 70,000 of those are probably going to be Bell's patients. Most of those patients are going to recover. So the incidence of synkinesis, while it's hard to estimate and maybe we don't have great data on it, the incidence of it is likely in the neighborhood of 15 to maybe even 30% of patients with Bell's. There are biases depending on how those uh, numbers are derived. But uh, needless to say, these are patients who have only had Bell's palsy. They've got a great life expectancy. So the prevalence of this is very high. And I've been treating a lot of these patients. And I've found that I've refi uh, I have refined my treatment algorithm for taking care of them. And so I wanted to uh, transmit some of that information to you. So to lay the, the groundwork and the foundation of understanding synkinesis, I find that uh, kind of a basic neurobiology discussion is good to do first. And it's very high level, uh, you know, we can really go down a rabbit hole with this topic, but I think in its simplest form, we can all understand it. So any peripheral motor nerve, it doesn't have to be just the facial nerve, but any motor nerve in the body, if it suffers injury, will subsequently undergo processes that we're familiar with as otolaryngologists. Wallerian degeneration will occur, metabolizing and clearing the way from the distal nerve so that nerve regeneration can then occur. And, and it does occur, it occurs robustly. Uh, axonal regeneration is a process that I would say is sometimes harder to stop uh, than it may be to start. Even though we treat paralysis and it seems like axonal regeneration would be difficult, axons robustly regenerate. They do so powerfully. The thing that they don't do is precision. They are not very or always accurate and precise about the destination to which they go to. And so in this simplified diagram that we're using, after injury, we can get perfect re like we've shown here, or we can get off-target re -innervation. It's kind of the, uh, um, the Bugs Bunny taking a left turn on the way to Albuquerque or whatever. And so uh, the wrong endoneural tubule is used by the regenerating axon, and uh, it ends up at the wrong motor end plate, the wrong neuromuscular junction. So you can see already uh, just on a basic kind of axonal level, even though this is idealized, how we can get synkinesis. But that's not all. So after a nerve is injured, it's actually quite normal for there to be polyphasic sprouting of the axons. It's a little bit more common maybe in sensory nerves, but it happens in motor nerves too. Now, the body may prune or pare these down, but it doesn't always occur. So poly re uh, of a motor of several different motor end plates by one axon can occur. So you can see on many levels from the biology of this, we're kind of hardwired for this problem to occur. I think the body would prefer a problem of a little excess, but off target re rather than less. So you can see though from the you know, kind of very beginnings how synkinesis can occur. So when it presents to us clinically though, we know that what we see is the muscle movement uh, or the mix of abnormal movement. And this is defined by Roger Crumley in 1979. And it's still a very apt uh, definition of the process that synkinesis is unintentional motion of one area of the face when you're trying to move another. For example, the eyes closed during smile, which my patient is here. And so as I'm uh, counseling patients and, you know, getting them ready to understand what's going on. And then from that segue into uh, treatments, 
you know, we'll talk in broad terms about, you know, your efforts to use a, a particular part of the facial nerve to move the zygomaticus muscle. Instead, when you're attempting to do that, there's some nerve input because of the cross wiring that ends up innervating the orbicularis oculi, uh, causing the forceful eye closure that you see exhibited in my patient here in her right eye. But it's not just that pattern. It can be, you can just shuffle the deck of all the names of the branches of the nerves and you can have that pattern of aberrant re -innervation. So likewise, during the effort to smile and move the zygomaticus muscle, you can have forceful sometimes contraction of the platysma, even some of the lesser well-known muscles. It's possible for the digastric to be involved. That can be a painful process. So there's a lot of complexity and nuance. And the more I talk to these patients, work with them and treat them, uh, the more that this kind of opens up to me. So uh, one of the topics that I'm gonna cover later because it's uh, increasingly popular, it's increasingly discussed and, and, and used more frequently now is selective neurectomy. I knew that this was an old procedure. So I went back into some of the historical publications and I tried to find the earliest uh, publication that I could. Um, sorry, one second. Getting a text from a colleague and replying giving grand rounds. So uh, the uh, oldest uh, description of, of selective neurectomy that I could find had this quote at the outset. Um, and it was a perfect encapsulation of uh, something that I think is very important to the uh, treatment of this disease. And it is that the treatment of spastic facial palsy, which is what they were labeling it, not synkinesis, but it's the same thing. Uh, it must be undertaken since it is permanent and a progressive disorder. Um, the thing that leaps out to me here is that it is permanent. If you remember our little diagram, the illustration that we were just looking at, um, when the axon regenerates to target, to a motor end plate, even if it's the wrong one, it is home. It is there forever. So this is a permanent situation that this uh, patient is dealing with. So therefore, it demands of us treatment for it. I think that when we take a synkinetic patient, sometimes next to a, say a patient with flaccid facial palsy, the synkinetic patient can look much better, but they can feel very subjectively affected by this. And there is real facial dysfunction there. So because of the permanence of this process, I really like that to kind of set the table for what we do for treatment. So uh, uh, the treatment algorithm that we use uh, here is as follows. So, and I'll go through each of these incrementally, but just to give us a quick kind of walkthrough. After a consultation with me where I, you know, make a, a diagnosis and you know, make sure that they really had Bell's palsy or that the you know, etiology of facial nerve injury was as advertised and there's no uh, indication for further imaging and all those types of things. And I will say, the spastic uh, face, spastic movement of the face uh, can be a bit of a neurological phenomenon. You do have to be a bit careful and keep uh, kind of your antenna up for things that might uh, require a referral to a neurologist or imaging by you to, to get some work up done. So those are things you have to consider. Uh, but granted, we've made a diagnosis that the patient had Bell's palsy. Now they have synkinesis. The first step for virtually uh, all patients, I'd like them to undergo a course of facial neuromuscular retraining, specialized physical therapy, which I'll talk more about. That really lays the critical foundation for any future treatment and can be all the treatment the patient needs. So that really comes first. For a subset of patients, they then progress into chemo denervation of muscles that are firing at the wrong times using botulinum toxin. The broadening use of botulinum toxin to denervate malfunctioning, uh, misfiring muscles in the synkinetic face, in my opinion, that has really opened the gateway uh, so that uh, we have discovered other very effective treatments through the use uh, with a fine guided eye, uh, the use of Botox. That can be a treatment on its own, but it can also be a very useful guide for both the surgeon and the patient to understand what the potential role of surgical neurectomy or myectomy might be if it's a fairly severe debilitating case of synkinesis. There's a much smaller group, and I'll talk about the treatment algorithm and indications for treatment of this, but this is a bit of a talk in and of itself, but there's even a small percentage of patients 
who are really best suited for a gracilis free tissue transfer for their synkinesis. Those patients are really unmasked by the use of botulinum toxin denervation. Um, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Okay, so the first element of uh, treatment, as I said, is a uh, wonderful rehabilitative treatment and not all uh, centers are fortunate to have uh, somebody who is really skilled and talented at this, but Sarah Strandberg, she's a speech and language pathologist who many of you know, she is quite good uh, at facial neuromuscular retraining. And so I encourage all my patients to begin with either an in-person consultation or now in the COVID era, we've been taking full advantage of video consultations with Sarah, which is great for patients who come to see me on consult and maybe a return trip with a couple hour car drive is tough and they can see Sarah relatively quickly utilizing video, which I've been um, very enthusiastically using. So I can't do this, um, I can't do this complete justice uh, because you know I don't provide facial retraining, uh, but in trying to encapsulate it in a single slide, which may or may not be uh, possible, this is a specialized form of physical therapy. It's teaching the patient as much what they should be doing and also what to avoid. You will find if you treat these patients, some of them suffer from a little bit too much effort. They're trying so hard to move that that actually results in some of the visible dysfunction that they suffer from. So a guided hand to take them through how to focus on the muscles of the face, isolate the good movements, minimize the bad, that is extremely effective. So we want more functional movements. We want to decrease abnormal movements. And I think just a, an interesting uh, side note is that um, I believe that the, the muscles of the face don't have any Golgi tendon organs. So you don't get a lot of proprioceptive or really any proprioceptive feedback from your facial muscles. Pretty much what you get from your facial muscles is the disturbance of the soft tissue. And that's kind of how you know what your face is doing in space. But unlike your biceps or your triceps, you don't have as much of a like, I kind of know where my hand is in space right now. That type of knowledge for the face is a little bit different. And so it just underscores that facial retraining and this kind of sensitization to uh, how the, face, the facial muscles are moving is really critical. Um, but from my perspective, the real key is that the patients become more sophisticated, able to provide me more accurate and specific feedback to what's working and what's not. They become experts at the movement of their own face. So one of the reasons I really like it up front is I feel like they're able through training to really isolate what our goals of treatment are. What are the things that they're not able to get yet? And what do we need to target with botulinum toxin? And then subsequently perhaps with surgery. So in order to validate that this really does work, you'd be surprised there's not a lot of data out there. Um, this is a commonly used thing. Facial retraining is uh, you know, pretty much, I would say, standard of care to uh, try to treat somebody with synkinesis. Um, but not a lot of studies have demonstrated the clinical efficacy of it. So in an effort to do that at our own center, we performed a retrospective analysis of just under about 200 of our patients. And there was a small subset uh, who had undergone with no botulinum toxin, no surgery, had completed facial neuromuscular retraining alone. And as some of you know, uh, one of my kind of central hypotheses of uh, facial dysfunction and facial paralysis is that it is a disease of communication. And I have a couple publications that ex uh, explore the impact of facial paralysis and facial dysfunction on something called communicative participation. And that's your willingness to just participate verbally with people you know, people you don't, different scenarios. It's an across disease metric. Um, but to cut to the chase here, we found a significant improvement in patients' communicative participation when they had completed the course of uh, facial retraining with Sarah. So you could see that the starting value was just under 15. It's a scale that goes from zero to 30. So you can see an extraordinarily strong statistical effect. We also had an uh, improvement, significant improvement in patient quality of life with a disease specific instrument. And there's more data on the page, but I just wanted to highlight the you know, really profound improvement in communicative participation. It's uh, kudos to Sarah's great work with these, with these patients. So as I said though, for a subset, they may need botulinum toxin in addition to facial retraining. Um, the former group that I just showed did not have that. 
And Botox has been shown in many studies to improve facial symmetry and significantly improve patient quality of life in those patients who have synkinesis. Uh, so as a patient is shown here, it can be used for better symmetry for sure, better movement of the oral commissure, and I'll uh, talk about that a lot more in subsequent slides, uh, but also improving facial comfort by reducing facial spasm that they're experiencing. Okay, now as I'm coaching a patient through this, there's more than a small number that will say, look, I am not that enthusiastic about getting Botox injections you know, every three months for the rest of my life. And while that is true, and there's nothing that can completely replace Botox, I introduced the concept at this point that, look, botulinum toxin is, can be both a therapy, but it can also guide us. It can guide both me, the surgeon, and the patient into what muscles, when denervated chemically, exert a therapeutic effect. And it allows them to live with that. They walk around with that for months. So they become very well versed in what the potential result of a neurectomy or myectomy may be if they're guided by somebody who's experienced in those procedures. So for me, this is actually a critically important setup for how we're going to treat them. We use it both for outright therapy. They're welcome to just continue on with Botox. But then secondly, um, they can use this as a guide for further treatment. Um, but many of my patients have a simpler question. Uh, they will come to me and just say, this all sounds great. I think I understand synkinesis now. Sarah helped me a lot. Um, I understand there's, you know, Botox is an option. Am I going to smile again? Because that can be one of the most debilitating things. Of course, there's all different varieties of kind of muscle dysfunction. The eye region could be most bothersome to them, but a lot of my patients are really focused on, will I smile again? So in order, to, um, in order to answer that question, I explain to them that they have to understand that they're in a slightly unique circumstance. So a patient with synkinesis may not smile because they have a tug of war that's going on between the elevators of the modiolus, the muscles that are trying to elevate the upper lip and produce a smile, and those muscles that are the depressors that are in effect co-contracting and freezing the face, holding the smile down such that it cannot elevate. So this is a tug of war between the lip elevators and the lip depressors. So it results in essentially no meaningful movement uh, of the modiolus. And so this is where botulinum toxin is very effective and a very useful tool in treating and maybe planning future treatment. And the strategy is a fairly simple one. If we use this analogy of a tug of war, what we're gonna do is isolate some combination of the depressors and provide a chemical, uh, chemical denervation that lasts for about three months and then see if that can unmask some movement of the zygomaticus muscles that wasn't visible before because of the co-contraction. This is not as simple as you know, two injections in those two locations. This is just you know, a simplified diagram. Uh, in general, I believe that the closer that you get to the lip, the more dysfunction that you can have um, if you're paralyzing for three months. So you have to gauge the patient's risk tolerance. Uh, you have to do a very careful physical exam. And you have to explain to the patient that it is an iterative process, that you know, you're going to be you know, sequentially taking these muscles offline and seeing if you can find the right combination for them. So what we are doing is we are minimizing the impact and the power of the depressors to see if that can allow the modiolus to elevate during smile. Now, I had mentioned briefly gracilis free flap for synkinesis. Uh, this is for uh, a, a smaller percentage of patients who have synkinesis, but if you see many of them, there are a percentage of patients that have synkinetic movement. You will see the lower lip uh, contracting when they're not trying to do it, when they're doing other facial muscles, but they have a really hollow, really sunken, and small cheek. That's a sign of atrophy of the zygomaticus muscles and some of the muscles that are in that area. So you have to have an extra index of suspicion that perhaps in this patient, it may not be adequate to denervate the depressors. Chemical denervation or surgical denervation isn't gonna do a thing for somebody who has no power in their zygomaticus. You have to think a little bit differently for this patient and think about neuromuscular supplementation. And in my mind, the best candidate for that is a gracilis free tissue transfer. But onto the more common scenario, what I want to talk about is how do we, you know, execute this uh, concept of denervating the depressors 
in order to show a patient what a potential surgical result might look like, uh, and then to execute a surgery that uh, uh, gives them benefits. So this is back to our index patient. And after a course of a variety of injections using botulinum toxin, uh, we found that she got pretty reliable uh, relief and benefit that was to her liking with treatment of the mentalis and the platysma. And you believe, better believe I injected the depressor anguli oris, I, I injected uh, buccinator, I believe, depressor labii inferioris. So, you know, we're going from, you know, as much excursion in the oral commissure as we can. But you have to understand that some patients are not going to like the result of denervation of all of that perioral musculature. And so because of that, I really do like using botulinum toxin as a way of guiding both myself and the patient through what should we target if we were to translate this chemical denervation into a surgical selective neurectomy. So the plan is really guided by the Botox. And so we've already demonstrated efficacy that she feels a lot better when certain muscles are denervated. So the cervical branch and the distal portion of the marginal mandibular branch are both targeted in surgery. And so you can see her uh, postoperative result with much less contraction, essentially no contraction of the platysma. I did a contralateral procedure as well, uh, denervated and transected the platysma on the left. Um, much less, though still some dimpling of the mentalis, uh, a better result, a more symmetric uh, smile. And interestingly enough, uh, for this patient, she, although she has oral ocular synkinesis, if you look at her before picture, the right eye is certainly closing. Uh, that does not mean that the eye is well lubricated and that the cornea is healthy. So patients can have excess closure with smile, but that doesn't mean that their corneal protection is very good and they may not have normal tear film production um, due to the prior facial nerve injury and faulty re -innervation. She has a more central uh, um, injury location. So to cut to the chase, we can't Botox her right eye. So this is her without Botox to the right eye. But in a successful case, the selective neurectomy can decrease the effort that a patient has to exert to get the movement that they do get. And that can calm down some of the contractions that you may see in other areas. That's not a reliable thing, but it's a noticeable thing and a notable thing, a very nice thing for a patient when they do have that. So that's no blepharoplasty was performed and no Botox injected uh, in the orbicularis oculi. So uh, what about other parts of the face? It's not just uh, perioral muscles that can be targeted in this fashion. So you can use tried and true uh, aesthetic techniques for your access to perform myectomy. As many of you know, uh, an endoscopic brow lift, a good uh, endoscopic brow lift will, uh, as part of it, divide the corrugators and procerus muscle to relieve some of the frown lines that uh, uh, people may notice. And that's uh, one of the goals of a, a good endoscopic brow lift. So in a patient like mine who's shown here on the left, she's bothered by some of the periorbital contractions that she has. And for her, the corrugator is very bothersome. Uh, she's a very high functioning person. This is my uh, other patient I showed you was. And, um, you know, sometimes a little bit of corrugator contraction with orbicularis ocular can really impart a completely different emotional state than the person is trying to convey. So we, over multiple rounds of botulinum toxin injection, demonstrated that we had good efficacy from the points that I showed there. So we followed that up with an endoscopic brow lift and a myectomy releasing those muscles um, uh, bluntly uh, through an endoscope with incisions that are all hidden uh, in the hairline. So as some of you know, the endobrow incisions are hidden kind of up in the hairline. So it uh, minimizes the morbidity. There uh, should be no scalp numbness from this procedure uh, when done uh, uh, properly and successfully. Uh, and it can, it can help give the patients a Botox-like effect uh, and a relaxation of some of the synkinetic musculature. Okay. So, as I said, the um, minority of patients, though, may require a gracilis for treatment, but I do think that there are kind of separate selection criteria. There's certainly a longer conversation that has to be ha had with patients, but increasingly I'm seeing this as a very viable option uh, for patients with synkinesis who have uh, no power of the zygomaticus that we can uncover through denervation. However, I'm going to uh, shift gears here to the second part of my talk. And this is a bit of a follow-up on a talk that I've given previously. 
Um, when I first came here about two and a half years ago, uh, I talked about nerve transfer techniques and we have follow up on some of our patients uh, over longer periods of time. And I just wanted to share some of the results and also so this will connect back a, a little bit to some of the things that we talked about with synkinesis uh, and how we manage those patients. Um, so now I'll shift gears and talk about nerve transfer surgery for patients with chronic facial paralysis. So this is, again, truly shifting gears. These are different patients. This is, uh, these are surgical procedures that by and large are going to be offered for patients who have facial paralysis that is non-recoverable. So this is a patient with a flaccid paralysis absolutely no movement and no prospect for recovery of meaningful movement. So we do our routine facial analysis targeting the zones of the face, but the bottom bullet point is oftentimes where we spend a lot of our time. And so of course we want good eye protection, but patients are very focused, particularly in my practice on restoration of smile. And if something they don't always voice, but I think is very important is trying to improve uh, or restore, in some cases, symmetry at rest. I think that that is something that can really be a driver of how normal patients feel and how uh, they are willing to kind of re-engage in their normal activities. So that's a focus of uh, many of the treatments that I offer. So I'm just gonna do a quick background on common nerve transfers that are uh, used in facial reanimation and talk about the iterative steps that we've taken to improve upon these techniques, which I think that uh, we have. So the most well-described technique is a hypoglossal nerve transfer, uh, very well described. And there's a lot of different ways to do it. I'll talk about one in particular. The most popular uh, and most commonly employed reanimation uh, nerve transfer technique nowadays is the masseteric nerve transfer. Over the last 10 years, it's had 10 to 15 years, it's had an explosion uh, of use. It can be very effective, but it does have some downsides and I'm gonna discuss those later. There are other donor nerves, of course, um, Particularly the spinal accessory nerve uh, has been used uh, by some investigators, but um, by some surgeons, but that uh, can be morbid. And so these are the two that you will see by far uh, most commonly uh, in facial reanimation techniques. And so what are their pros and cons? So the hypoglossal nerve, very well described. Uh, it does provide some movement, but mostly I think of this as providing some resting tone. It gives the face that kind of certain something, the je ne sais quoi of like, uh, not complete flaccid paralysis. So it's very meaningful for some patients. And I've had uh, some patients who've undergone this surgery who uh, I've talked to them about subsequent additional surgeries and they really have felt like they didn't need them. And I was always struck by those early cases of patients who felt like they were uh, sufficiently rehabilitated, rehabilitated with this technique. Um, because as I've drawn it here, I am drawing an end to side nerve transfer of the facial nerve brought down to the hypoglossal nerve. In this instance, in this fashion, typically there may be a little bit of a longer wait time for re just because you've increased the distance that the regenerating axons from the hypoglossal nerve have to travel through the paralyzed facial nerve. Okay, uh, as I said, very common, uh, commonly used procedure now is the masseteric nerve transfer. Uh, it's an easy nerve to isolate anatomically uh, and it can have some amazing results for smile restoration. It can be done in several different ways. Uh, one is a selective nerve transfer. Uh, one is a coaptation directly to the main trunk of the facial nerve, which is shown here. And then the uh, variation on that is a selective uh, nerve to masseter transfer, also called a masseteric nerve transfer. The, uh, the thought of this procedure is that you can utilize the advantage of leaving the rest of the facial nerve intact. So if uh, a patient, and this is a valid way of doing this, I still do it this way for certain patients, if they are likely to recover some function or you'd like to wait and see what they recover, uh, maybe they have a borderline EMG, electromyography, that says that maybe they would get some function back, but they're a bit more aggressive and they'd like to have something to re their smile and have that kind of in the bank. This is a valid way of doing the procedure, leaving the rest of the facial nerve uh, connected. I did this a lot earlier in my career. I was uh, on faculty uh, at USC for four years before coming here. And I, I, this was the most common uh, method that I used for mass nerve transfer. And so what I found is there was three outcomes. You would have people who had smile reanimation and got some tone back from that nerve. And that was great. That was a very positive outcome. You would have people who could get some smile reanimation, but get absolutely nothing out of their facial nerve. Um, 
And then you would have people who would have smile reanimation from the nerve transfer, but get synkinesis, sometimes really severe synkinesis out of the native facial nerve recovery. Two out of those three things I found very unsatisfactory. And so that was the initial seed that caused me to kind of think about, are there kind of maybe different ways that we can uh, design this procedure to be done? This is a procedure, or sorry, this is a patient of mine and Dr. Sirjani's who had a, uh, only a selective masseteric nerve transfer and she's not smiling at all on the left side. And this is her a few months, about six months after surgery doing her masseteric driven smile. You can see the kinetics are you know, a little bit different. She's an ideal candidate for this because she has essentially very little resting tone to her face. When she is in repose, her face is extremely relaxed. So she's a great candidate for this because the masseteric nerve transfer is not providing her with a uh, resting facial tone. In an attempt to address this, uh, we then devise kind of a next iterative step, which is to combine the two techniques together and they can be efficiently combined in something that we've labeled a dual nerve transfer. And that's bringing together a end to side coaptation of the facial nerve from its second genu, which does require mastoidectomy and nerve decompression down to the hypoglossal nerve combined then with a masseteric nerve transfer. And so we've done a uh, review of, uh, of a small cohort, cohort of these patients when we had let some time go by, I realized we had greater than one year follow-up on a few of these patients. And I was uh, you know, reasonably pleased with what I was seeing in clinic. So we decided to do a pretty dedicated analysis of this small group of patients. So. Um, all of these participants had um, a history of permanent facial paralysis, negative EMG on testing. Again, that's very important because we are cutting the facial nerve. This is a very, this is a very definitive step. Uh, so you have to make sure that the patient selection is done carefully. Um, and we had greater than one year follow-up. And so we really uh, went after them and analyzed their outcomes with a lot of modern tools. We used the facial clinometric evaluation, which is a disease-specific quality of life measure. We use the E-Face, which I think is really great, and it's uh, for a surgeon or a clinician to score a patient's video. So they do a standardized set of movements, and then I or another practitioner scores their movement on the E-Face, and that uh, gives us data on how well they're moving, which I'll share with you. And then we also use something called the Emotrix software. Uh, Emotrix is a uh, biometric uh, um, labeling of points, and I'll show you an example of that. So first I'm gonna show you the technique. Uh, this is a technique of dual nerve transfer. This was uh, from a publication that was in JAMA Facial Plastics. So use a modified facelift incision, but friendly post auricular extension for our neurotology colleagues. Uh, and then so our neurotologist, I think this is Dr. Santa Maria, uh, is, uh, has drilled out and decompressed the facial nerve. I'm then gonna transpose it down into the neck. Uh, this is a little uncomfortable because you're kind of reaching up underneath the mandible I make about a 30% neurotomy. I uh, usually try to do the posterior or medial suture first because it's a little bit more uh, troublesome to get in place, I find. Uh, and then we're going to do an endocyte coaptation. I usually do either three or four um, uh, sites of coaptation. Less is more. Uh, the, if you can get good coaptation in that position with the mouth of the epineurium really nice and wide and facing your neurotomy, then that's uh, what I'm looking for. And this is just a uh, placement of a uh, uh, couple other sutures here. I think this is gonna transition to the masseteric nerve transfer next. Uh, so now we're in a facelift approach, we're in the cheek. Uh, this is a buckle branch, a big buckle branch. I use a finder needle with epinephrine to find the sigmoid notch. Uh, that gives me hemostasis from the masseteric artery, which can be really troublesome, but it also tells me right where the masseteric nerve is gonna be within about a quarter size uh, of area. And then we do a blunt dissection down through the masseter muscle. Even if you don't do the injection, it's not as bloody as you think, uh, but you do have to use bipolar cautery to kind of work your way down deeper into the muscle. And you enter into these planes where the different lobes of the muscle are kind of bifurcating. And that's oftentimes where you will see the nerve. There's some editing there you got there pretty quick, but we'll see the masseteric nerve. It's not huge but its axonal count is really high, very robust. We do a distal cut of the nerve uh, and then transpose that back more superficially into the field. I'm gonna cut the selected buckle branch 
this is one of the issues with the procedure. This is a denervated face. There's no electrical stimulation that you can use here. So you use anatomy as your guide uh, in selecting which of the buccal branches to connect the masseteric nerve to. You're down a little bit uh, in a pit there, but uh, you only need one or two sutures. Uh, and usually because you can cut back the buccal branch fairly proximally, uh, there's never really trouble in co-opting it. Uh, really, the, the question is, is what type of movement do you get out of those two nerve transfers when you cobble them together? So uh, these are our patients and some of the data that we retrieve from the analysis. Um, so uh, we had patients stay usually a couple days, I think uh, overnight to two nights maybe. We were probably keeping them a little longer for no good reason in the beginning. Uh, we did have a patient who uh, had a post-op CSF leak, and um, I have to attribute that to the translabyrinthine resection that was done at the same time. So we got pretty efficient right away with these and then uh, combined it with a translab, and then that patient did have a CSF leak, um, uh, which uh, can be something that complicates recovery, but uh, from the dual nerve transfer per se uh, would not necessarily be something that you'd expect because uh, uh, we're pretty far from CSF. So this is a patient, first patient who had it, um, many of you have seen uh, her results. Uh, she has no movement of the right side of her face. This is her early result at six months with a uh, soft smile and then a full smile with a really nice dentate smile. Uh, this is the allure of nerve transfers is they can provide a smile that is very hard to beat with a gracilis because it is using the native musculature. But there's other variability with this procedure that I'm going to show you in some subsequent patients. So this is her at 14 months. She's going to clear the hair a little bit kind of midway through her exam. We're not expecting any eyebrow movement. We're really not expecting eye closure. The eye closure she gets is from an eyelid weight that I placed in her upper lid. I did a lower lid tightening uh, procedure on her as well. Um, you can see there's a little gap, a little asymmetry with uh, uh, the right lower lip sagging just a bit, but her soft smile and broader smile are really, really nice. It doesn't eliminate contralateral hyperkinesis because you can see her left depressor angular oris still contracts. Uh, this is another patient who uh, had this procedure. This is her pre-op, which I'm going to just leave running. She has no movement in the left side of her face. This is a patient who she starts by talking, which is really valuable because you're not using the masseter, you're not using your hypoglossal nerve, so you get to kind of see just with nothing, what, what is it? And so the mouth holes to the right side, and especially when she laughs. Perfect smile, though. And again, this is really hard to beat with a gracilis. Um, thus, the, you know, the attraction to these uh, procedures. So that when she uh, decides that it's time to bite down to initiate her smile, she can really match the two sides well together very nicely. Uh, Dr. Ben Erickson's oculoplastic surgeon, he did tremendous work on her eyes um, uh, there, and she's having a tough time with the exam uh, there, but feeling a lot better in the post-op. This is another patient of mine. There'll be no movement in the right side of the face. Um, and then I'm going to go ahead and fast forward to the uh, video uh, of her at 12 months post-op. She has uh, some signs here of uh, some unwanted movement, and this really circles back to synkinesis. It's kind of why I oriented the talk this way. Uh, she has no upper eyelid weight. She was kind of getting good enough eye closure, but subsequently I think she did get a weight. Um, and so she's using her masteric nerve to close her eye a little bit. Her mouth is not as pulled over it was before. Soft smile is okay, but you can see a firm smile. There's a little bit of unwanted contraction of the levator labii superioris uh, and excessive eye closure. So it doesn't totally look natural. It could be balanced with Botox, which I can't get her to do. Um, but this shows you a little bit of variability of the procedure. Uh, this is uh, the final patient that I'll show. This is her pre-op. She's having a benign inflammatory lesion that was causing facial paralysis resected at the same time. And she subsequently got this CSF leak. Um, and her and her family felt that that was a significant thing, a significant issue for quality of life, and it's, you know, not to be, not to be minimized. Uh, so there's her movement pre-op, and then post-op, I have just kind of a quick video of her using her uh, masseteric nerve to smile and doing so very, very nicely. So looking at the data that we retrieved from our analysis, we first used the e-face, and so this is 
uh, me and observers scoring global movement globally uh, via multiple metrics that then get combined into one score. What is their static symmetry like? How much dynamic movement do they have? And how much synkinesis do they have? And we've got pre in blue and then post in orange. And I, I really would uh, like to thank Tyler uh, Tyler Auckland and Noel Ayu. They did great work on this study. It's really an exhaustive analysis, even though they've only got a small number of patients. So thank you to them. So you can see a significant improvement in dynamic movement, um, worsening of synkinesis, which we saw in one of the patients there clearly. Um, static symmetry improved as a statistical trend, but not yet significant. And the composite value very near significance. When we looked at the biometric data, and use fiduciary marking points. Uh, there was a significant, this is analysis of a still shot image. So uh, this is um, a very different analysis than the E-face that I just showed you, but there's significance across essentially all metrics, the excursion, commissure, height, smile angle, all very much improved. Uh, commissure excursion uh, measured as percent deviation when the face is relaxed uh, and the height of the commissure. Uh, both showing either trends or statistically significance in the uh, statistically significant change in the right direction. So, kind of bringing this all together, we didn't have any uh, patients who had hemiatrophy of the tongue, and that was closely assessed by me in post-op clinic. No dysarthria. There were no perioperative complications that we attributed directly to the dual, dual nerve transfer surgery, but we did have that CSF leak, and the quality of life improvement was also close to significance with just a small number of patients, a statistical trend. And we have a couple of more patients who are kind of getting closer to graduating from their one-year result. I think that will add uh, some more information, whether it be positive or negative, will be uh, useful new information on the results of this procedure. So my conclusion is this is a clinically useful procedure, but it does have some drawbacks. There is a significant increase in clinician scores in kinesis. And after we just had a long discussion about the nuanced management of synkinesis, uh, that's something that you should have an appreciation now is this can be very clinically significant. So um, that's not to be uh, minimized or uh, just kind of passed off. It's of course a really small cohort. I'm not doing a direct comparison to other techniques. That's a very hard thing to achieve um, in facial reanimation surgery, but I think in encouraging results. And to kind of bring this um, around again and uh, get us closer towards the end of the procedure. Uh, this patient and I, we saw each other many times in clinic, we're very close, she's just a wonderful, wonderful person. And, you know, as I showed you with her video, she has this uh, flaccidity uh, during, uh, she has this flaccidity of movement when she's speaking. Um, but when she smiles, her smile is her normal smile. She even shows me, you know, I had this dimple before, I had this, we're like, this is my smile, you know, it's back but it's not spontaneous, right? So when, we, when she gets told a joke or laughs or something, you, know, you can see her there, boom, there's nothing because she's a happy person, she's laughing, and there is no contralateral input. So we had uh, some long discussions, and I'm gonna give you a spoiler alert here. I did another surgery, but I don't have the results yet, so sorry to disappoint you, but it is a very intriguing concept of how we can kind of string together base hits to try to make a meaningful difference in patient outcome here. So what she had, she said, look, is there any way that we can make this spontaneous? And I said, well, you know, we could try a cross-facial nerve graft. Um, a cross-facial nerve graft will not work in a paralyzed face. So if you go into a patient with facial paralysis and uh, they have chronic facial paralysis, and you use a cross-facial nerve graft and connect it to one of the paralyzed branches, you will get little to no meaningful movement from that. Um, combine that with the fact that if the face is paralyzed, you do not know which branch to use. You can't electrically stimulate. For the masteric nerve transfer, I have some anatomic guides that I use that give me you know, reasonably reliable res results for smile reanimation. But what I realized in this patient's case is because we had done the dual nerve transfer previously, we now have the ability to go back in and use electrical stimulation completely. It should be electrically, electrically kind of compliant. We should be able to put 
a probe on the individual branches and select which one we might want to co-opt for a cross-facial nerve graft. Not only that, the burden of regeneration is now much lower because we have a completely an otherwise viable left side of the face. And so when we connect the cross-facial nerve graft, we're doing so to a freshly cut branch that we know the function of. So this is something that I was much more uh, willing to provide with the one provision I told her, would you be willing to risk the smile that you get when you bite? Would you be willing to put that on the table if you could do this spontaneously? Maybe if it's not as robust or not as strong, you know, what do you think? And then her choice was yes. So we went ahead and did a cross facial nerve graft. This is just only about uh, three months ago that we did the procedure, maybe four months ago. I'm seeing her again soon. She did get a Tonell sign very rapidly. So her Tonell sign, which is a tingling sensation that oftentimes starts at the side of placement of the graft and then goes across the face. Her Tonell's crossed her face in three months. So I don't want to short call myself I'm optimistic, but I think to me, this kind of brings together these concepts of management of synkinesis, selective denervation or selective re -innervation restoring nerve supply to the nerve and using that as one more toehold as we try to progress forward and make more and more impactful and meaningful results for our patients. So I want to thank you and I especially wanted to thank all of you guys for being so supportive as this program has grown um, and the referrals, the collaboration, and then in particular the support from Rob and Sam, you know, really getting behind this program has been really meaningful for me. I appreciate it so much. So I'm gonna stop the screen share, and I left a few minutes here. If there's any questions, uh, please send them to me. I should be able to hold them. Great talk, John Paul, great talk. And so if you have questions, you have please questions. put it in the chat, and I'll stay on for a little bit here, but if you don't have any questions, we can, we can conclude. So thank you guys so much. This is Rob JP, just a phenomenal job of building uh, a terrific facial nerve center, a leading facial nerve center. Beautiful work. Well done. Thank you. Oh, and just a quick reminder, I cannot hear you as well, so please do use the chat. Uh, if you'd like, there is, uh, from Mike, questions. what is the rehab like after the uh, procedure? I'm in fee yeah. because I got three kids. Maybe probably going nuts behind me if I was at home. Can you see the chat box? Ah. I can't, I can't, yeah, I can't hear you. Yeah. yeah, sorry. Um, can you see the chat, the chat box? Sorry, if you can type it in, Rob. Just let me protect the grass with the first surgery so that it's easier to come back for a cross motion nerve back a little bit. Something to protect the grass with the first surgery. Um, thanks for the question, Lisa. So. Oh, good. Oh, the chat box. <laughs> chat box. Share screen for chat box. I think is what I'm being told, so everybody can see it. All right, here we go. And there we go. Oop, where's my chat box? Oh, we can see it. All right, something else. Screen share. Well. I'm unable to show you guys the chat box. I apologize, but um, I'll tell you what the questions are. Chat box. So, we, oh, you can see it. Okay, great. Thank you, Rob. Um, so uh, Lisa's question about protecting the graft at the first surgery to, so that it's easier to come back for a cross facial nerve graft at a later date. Uh, that is a great question. So I try to take uh, video documentation is great so that I, I have a little bit of a map of, you know, sort of where things are. Um, I have placed a long uh, 6-0 proline suture. If I think I'm going to come back, I will uh, sometimes place a long suture, and that helps. 
you can kind of follow that home. I think one of the important considerations though, is if you think you're gonna come back for a cross facial nerve graft, think about what you don't wanna put in there. So um, some of those patients, you could really say we could put some fascia in there, a fascia lata to suspend the face. Um, that's gonna make it really hard to find the nerves. Uh, that's something that I think would cause a lot of fibrosis. And uh, so I think about maybe not leaving things, but a long 6.0 proline is something that I've used before. I had a colleague who actually used a PE tube, uh, somebody, another facial uh, reanimation surgeon who said he uses a, a, a PE tube, not to the otology uh, faculty, um, because you it's more palpable so that, you know, when you're kind of looking around and you want to see it, uh, you've got something that you can feel. I thought that was kind of a cool idea, but I always got worried that it would bug the patient or cause like a reaction. So I never did it. Yeah, you know, that, that's a great point, Lisa. Thank you for these really great uh, thoughts and questions. Um, there's, there, uh, I'm trying to think, it's, a doctor, it's Quinn Wynn at UC San Diego uh, has done some uh, really well-regarded work with uh, fluorescent labeling of, of the nerve. Um, Tulio and I have talked about ways that we could combine uh, some of our research, but I, I'm very interested in doing that. I think that, um, you know, especially for revision cases, that's where it would be really helpful where you have fibrotic tissue mixed with nerve. Uh, that's where the fluorescence would be so critical. Um, one of the things that's interesting about injured nerves, uh, because I've operated on like nerve injury early nerve injury, injury late weeks or a month or two months afterwards is the degree of fibrosis that surrounds a nerve is profound. And some of my research is kind of exploring this stuff. But basically what I think is that the, the body, if there's an injured nerve that's not repaired, repaired, it tries to fibrose the area off. It tries to wall it off like a scab. So in the hopes that it, it leaves itself with a little protected zone for the axons to regenerate, or that's how I kind of think my way through it. So when you go into a delayed injury, or when there's another substance, like I was saying, the fluorescence would be super valuable for trying to pick up a little signal and guide you home. Because um, if you've got electrical response, it's great, but you usually don't. So that's that's a great, and I'll, I'll take that name down, so thank you. Thank you. It's always a fun thing to watch. Something about it. <laughs> I had some video from the cross facial nerve case that I showed, but I just couldn't get it edited in time. But that'll be uh, that'll be something I show, as long as it works the way we hope. Okay, guys, I think if there's no more questions, I'm probably going to log off. Thank you so much for listening. I hope you guys are all well. I miss being uh, in the room together, making it a real grand rounds, but I really appreciate you guys logging on. Okay. All right. Take care, everybody. I'm going to log off. Okay. Bye. Thanks, JP. Well done.